kazoos, bitches. Bring that up. Bring this up. Hi. My name is Imogen Spear. And now that you know who I am, I'd like to introduce you to Roy Chapman Andrews, the OG Dr. Jones. From the beginning of his life to the end, Roy traveled the world. He discovered thousands of unknown species and was even embroiled in the espionage of World War I. Our story begins with a love letter that Roy wrote to Dr. Bumpus. <laughs> Super adorable, right? So Dr. Bumpus was the then director of the Natural History Museum of New York. And he wrote Roy back a very nice letter that Roy would actually write to several other aspiring naturalists through his life, which went something along the lines of, um, thanks for the props, kid. Sorry we don't have any work for you. But do come by the museum anytime you get a chance. And, um, you know, but don't make an effort to do so. And uh, so he did, of course. And he begged him for a job. He was just like, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll mop the floors. And Dr. Bumpus responded to him. He's like, that's no job for a college man. And he's like, no, 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 but they're, they're the museum's floors. <laughs> and if you let me, I'll do it and I'll love it. So he thought, this kid's got moxie. So he hired him to wash the floors. And he gave him some other jobs. And he started introducing him to people. And one of the jobs that he gave him was, have you recognized this piece? Um, yes, the blue whale that hangs in the ocean hall. Well, it had its predecessor, predecessor um, under the tutelage of Roy. So he got his first true start um, when he was sent to uh, the coast of Long Island. And he was, he was sent to bring back the bones of an actual whale that had died, um, which was gruesome, grisly, freezing work, as you might imagine. And of course, no small task. That's a, that's a whale skull. Um, he found this really fascinating, though. So he wrote, wrote um, probably the first scientific paper on whales. Um, before this time, science! Whales. Before this time, um, whaling was obviously quite a thing, but nobody had thought to like watch them in the wild and do any kind of proper study about them. He was like, sweet niche. Um, so he went out there and he started studying whales. He was taking photographs of them and, and everyone was like, wow, photos of real live whales in the wild. How wonderful. That's crazy. Um, so it got him enough publicity that he was able to snag a tag along basically on the next expedition, which went off to the East Indies. And he was supposed to bring back porpoises and new, new animal life and stuff. But his first stop um, was with some interesting people. Uh, he got very lucky because he met Martin, who was kind of the, the fixer of the Grand Hotel. Now, the Grand Hotel was like the to-do place in Japan. And um, it's really good to know a fixer if you have a lot of, like, you know, dubious customs that are coming in and out, imports, exports. So Martin was the guy to know. The other person that he got to know, which I thought was amazing, and I had to put her in my talk, was Mother Jesus. And Mother Jesus, of course, is the madam of the most uh, notorious whorehouse in Yoshiwara, also super classy. And she was the one who would give you some uh, secret infos if, if she liked you. And they got along like gangbusters, so she, he got all kinds of secret infos. Um, and also um, had some adventures in modesty while at number nine house. He also taught himself Japanese, which was pretty rad. Um, but eager to explore uncharted territories, uh, he went off to Indonesia, got himself stranded on a desert island and survived there for two weeks by like weaving palm fronds and stuff. Um, he went off to the jungles of the Philippines, hated it um, because if it wasn't the leeches that were crawling in through your like boot hole laces, uh, yeah, gross. Uh, it was the snakes. And yes, like his... Cinematic ancestor, he hated snakes. Um, he almost got eaten by one. Uh, n yeah, a giant python. It was like 20 feet long, which was probably an anaconda, to be honest, like hanging up in a tree. And if it were not for the keen eyesight of his, you know, servant boy, Miranda. Miranda! Miranda! Um, they would have been consumed. He also had a close run-in um, with some uh, natives in the wild mountains of Peru. Um, where he never saw any of them, but on his trail back, as they were heading back, they realized that there had been sharpened bamboo stakes, which were likely poisoned at the tips, right about thigh high, put along his return trail. So he and his troopers super skeeved out and like went off trail and were like super happy to leave the territory. Um, he didn't want to leave the territory though. He was so into this, it was so fun. 
so he kept looking around for things to do. And, he, and so while he was still in Japan, he started hearing um, some stories about the Korean devil fish. Now, the Korean devil fish sounded curiously like the California gray whale. But that was impossible because it had been extinct for 50 years. But it turns out it wasn't. He found it. It was just on the other side of the world. Science! Now, Science! Science! <laughs> now, not all was easygoing in whaling. There was a, a, a notable story when he was out with a uh, ship that had caught a 72-foot whale, and they were sending out the pram with the lancer to do like the final killing blow. And he was like, I want to take some photographs of that. That sounds sweet. So he gets on there, and he's like going up at the pram, and the whale's like, fuck you, and brings up his giant tail. Remember, this thing is 72 feet long, and like blasts it down, shatters the boat. Dudes go everywhere. Boat goes everywhere. Blood in the water. Everybody's like hanging on field zero life, trying not to be killed by this whale, screaming for help. And that's when he feels a bump on his leg. And he looks down, and yes, it's full of sharks. Tons of sharks. Everybody starts screaming, help, 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 help! And the captain, who's this like, stu super staunch like Norwegian guy who's up there, like, looks at the dude screaming for help, and he like, looks at the whale, and he's like, that's $1,000, and he saves the whale. <laughs> he runs out of fish, but he's not out of money, so he goes on his own adventures. He survives typhoons, cliffs, bandits. He even survives um, murder by an angry mob in Port Said with the help of a friendly Arab. Yeah. He's partying with Russian princes. Um, he even is hunting two man-eating tigers, which I'm really happy to say, out of the thousands of creatures that he brought back to the museum, acquired, um, these were the only two to totally escape him. They're like, nah, bro. <laughs> He finally gets um, his dream to go on a land expedition, and it goes smashingly well. It brings back thousands, thousands, thousands of animals. Um, and I kid you not, like literally, this guy's totals are, are ridiculous numbers of zeros of slaughtered, beautiful fauna. Um, but turns out, war puts a little crunch in his game. But like a red-blooded American that he is, he wants to rush back home and join the fight. Um, but keep in mind that he, at this point, is in Myanmar. So he's going down the Irrawaddy uh, to Rangoon, across the Bay of Calcutta, a whole breadth of India to Bombay, just to get a ship back to the USA. So he finally gets back, and he like, runs up to the recruiters, and he's like, dudes, I want to go to France. And they're like, dude, we have a great place for you in Washington. And he's like, that's so not romantic. So he starts crying his man tears, and he goes down to the pub to cry his man tears alone. And who should be there but, wow, big hame hunter Charles Sheldon, who turns out to be his buddy. And Charles is like, Roy, what a long face. I just, I just wired you. How could you be here today? This is amazing. Have I got the job for you? It's called espionage. <laughs> and it's back in China, and it's back in Mongolia, and you'll spend a lot of time there, but we can't talk about it. It's quite hush-hush. So he does. He spends a lot of time there. Can't talk about it. Quite hush-hush-hush. But he loves the desert. Absolutely loves it. Even though he's nearly killed and eaten alive by literally man-eating dogs. 14 versions of the Tibetan, Tibetan Mastiff, which I have to add, are not pets here. They are protection, and they are also literal eaters of the dead. They eat the dead llamas that just get like kind of checked out in the desert. So sleeping on the ground is not cool, um, which he finds out really quickly. But he's so enchanted by this wild, wild west of Mongolia that he starts wondering, maybe it could be the birthplace of ancient men which is a really great question to pose to the money, which is what you need if you want to do an expedition. So he talks to like JP Morgan, who by the way is awesome. He's like the super money shamer. He's, he thinks science is awesome. So he's just like, I'm gonna put down $50,000. Johnson, you'll, you're in for 10 and Edison, you're gonna give another 30 and he just tells it like it is. And it's just sort of the to do if you're in society. Uh, Rockefeller's a little harder of a sell, but he's got an, a, you know, a, a romantic soul, so he comes on board, and, and then it's off to the public, many of whom are ladies who are super interested in uh, joining by any means possible. Um, so he puts together a crack team. They're awesome. He puts together a fleet of Fords, which are way better than camels because they drink a lot less and they go a lot faster. The first hour of their like expedition is insane. They picked up like over 50 pounds of bones and come up with amazing creatures. Um, my favorite is the Balkutherium, um, which is the beak of Balkistan, beast of Balkistan. Blah, blah, blah. Say that three times fast. Um, it is 17 feet high at the shoulder. It's enormous. It's the largest mammal that has ever been known on Earth. Um, to give you a sense, like you see what that little dude is. Imagine a, an elephant just kind of taking over the belly. It's huge. It's super, super cool. They find tons of stuff. They find um, 
dinosaurs. One of them gets named after him. There's just, it, it's just littered. This desert is littered with goodies. So they're picking it all up, but it's not all easy. Um, they are right now heading straight into the middle of the Gobi Desert, and it is uncharted territory. Um, theoretically, it's been charted by Russians who say that there are, there's a 7,000 foot mountain range in there, but those mountains totally don't exist. So <laughs> they're just like driving along. They haven't seen people in 100 miles. They're running out of water. And finally, they, say that they see three gears in the distance. We're like, we're going to ask those guys where there's water. So they do. And one of their uh, fellows, a uh, wonderful one named Shackelford, who ended up finding a lot of the stuff and not getting a lot of the credit, um, walks over a, a ridge. And it's like, wow, those are some really, really cool bird eggs. Turns out they're the first dinosaur eggs ever known to man. Um, and they're, they're being uh, carried after by Oviraptor, which they, they name Egg Stealer, because they think she's trying to steal the eggs. And funny fact, it takes until 1995 for her to clear her name. She's actually the ma. Whoa. So these are her eggs. Um, and people go nuts back home. They're like, who cares about man? Dinosaur eggs are awesome. Um, so they go crazy for this. The expeditions go fantastically for about six more years until literally our heroes are run out of the Gobi Desert by a plague of pit vipers because it gets super freezing and the pit vipers are like, I just want snugs. It's really cold. It's really cold. But of course, that's not all that there is. China is like getting wise to this and they're like, you're paying how much money for pictures of dinosaur eggs? So they start seizing and releasing goods, and regardless, after about six years, the expeditions are over. Our hero heads back, and after spending so many years of his life gathering thousands of animals in unknown regions to the Western world um, for science, he, from mopping its floors, becomes the director of the Natural History Museum writes several books, and continues to inspire to this day. So, let us raise a toast to Roy Chapman Andrews and the scientific method. Yeah. I brought backup kazoos in case one didn't work. Hey guys. I am back to point out that not only did Imogen show up with double kazoos, she also has a utility belt and a whip and the whole outfit to tell this story. This seems like the kind of person we want in the fold, yeah? yeah. And it turns out this is her third talk on the Otsalon stage, so it's the chance we have to invite her into the fellowship. Imogen, will you accept this pin? She said yes! Imogen, will you put on the pin so that we can mark this moment? With all this good news, it might be crazy to admit there is more. <laughs> this is not the end of tonight's event. We have more coming at you. So before we break for our cocktail hour, I want to admit that um, there are many traditions in the Odslan community. We've been going now for five years. and. One of the things we really like to do is mark the occasion of not just fellows joining us, but also uh, parts of the Odslan community traveling to the ends of the earth. So Explorer is one night, but we do exploring on a regular basis. So we have many Odslan um, traditions, and one of them is to mark the occasion of our adventures, Harvey's, traveling far afield. 
So this summer, Adventure Harvey has had a very busy time. He's been arting in Minneapolis, adventuring around the salt flats of Bolivia, relaxing in wine country, wearing tinfoil hats in Las Vegas for DEF CON. <laughs> He's been practicing his bagpipes in Scotland and contemplating the natural world in Vancouver. He's visited his magical friends in Hogwarts. He's been museuming in San Jose, hiking in the Eastern Sierras, cocktailing in Wales, and sending his best to the fire weary in Yosemite. <laughs> Woo! If you happen to travel from time to time, you can get your own Harvey Wolpertinger travel bunny at the merch table. It's right over there. They have many a Harvey. Uh, Harvey comes in the classic design as well as a limited supply of tonight's theme Harvey, who's wearing a pip helmet, is ready to explore it with you. And I have great news. We'll be giving away one of these little guys after the break. So be sure to fill out the raffle ticket, enter to win, and stick around. You can find them at the door or the merch table. Enter in to win. The merch table, once again, is right over there. It's staffed by fine-looking volunteers. It has all kinds of odd salon goodies, as well as discount tickets for the next salon. And it is there because we rely on your support to make this whole crazy thing happen. So please go pay a visit to those fine folks. We are now going to take that short cocktail break. And when we come back, we have three more stories. And the second half is all about science. I know. Stick around. We're going to talk about the first female circumnavigator of the world by someone who had to disguise herself as a man in order to pull it off. We'll discuss the guy who wrote Darwin a letter about this crazy idea he had called evolution. And we'll hit on some true tales of Antarctic science, past and present, from someone who's been there and done that. So we'll see you in 15 minutes or so. Thanks for being here tonight. 